Good evening and um, welcome to the American Academy in Berlin. We are very pleased that tonight our distinguished visitor, Janine Di Giovanni, will be giving the Richard C. Holbrook Lecture. I would particularly like to thank the Fischer Verlag for their cooperation in making this event possible. And of course, the donors of the Richard Holbrook Distinguished Visitorship, some of whom are present here this evening, in particular Oliver Renner and Dirk Schmalenbach, Many thanks to you too. Tonight's presentation is entitled The Morning They Came For Us, Dispatches from Syria. And it's based on Janine Di Giovanni's book of the same title that describes her travels and her interviews in a war town, Syria. Now, Ms. Di Giovanni is an award-winning journalist. She is the current Middle East editor of Newsweek and a frequent contributor to the world's leading journalists, uh, journals, newspapers, magazines, you name it, anything printed. Okay, she's in it. She is, <laughs> she is also a consultant on Syria for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And this coming Thursday, Di Giovanni will be the 2016 recipient of the Courage in Journalism Award. Yes. She will have to fly back to the US for that. Now, it takes courageous and eloquent people like Janine Di Giovanni to make us aware not only of the terrible effects of war in Syria, but to make us aware that this conflict is close to our home. This is not some foreign, distant quarrel. This is war on our doorstep. We are witnessing atrocities being committed in a region of the world that is very close to Europe both geographically and culturally. Because in a global society, there is no far away. Complacency does no longer have a place in contemporary society, and we need to find constructive approaches to cultural and religious conflicts with a devastating effect on people's lives and the very concept of belonging and identity. As Mazen Darwish said at the Fellows' presentation here at the American Academy a few weeks ago, quote, Mazen Darwish said, it's not easy to be without country. And of course, this theme of displacement is echoed by the challenges of successful social integration. So as a consequence, as one of our fellows here, this term, Professor Charles Haber, puts it, what does it mean to take up a new life in the diaspora. So the thematic focus areas that the American Academy is concentrating on in the coming semesters are migration and integration. We see these two concepts, movement and social cohesion, as central denominators of the 21st century. Ideas of what, for instance, forced migration means in post-colonial times and how we define identity today will be explored more fully in the coming semesters by fellows and visitors from a transatlantic point of view here at the American Academy. We will approach these concepts not exclusively, but every so often, like tonight, from a multitude of different disciplines and perspectives, through different modes of presentation, such as film and narrative, journalism and academic analysis, works of art and public debates, both by detached observers and by those who can give first-hand reports based on personal experience. We at the American Academy are very proud to have you, Janine Di Giovanni, here with us tonight to share your insights and your analysis of the war, war in Syria, its causes and effects. And to this end, you will show us a short part from a documentary entitled Seven Days in Syria, followed by your presentation. We will then have time for some questions and answers. After which, we'd like to invite you all to continue the discussion at the reception in the next doors and in our library. Janine Di Giovanni, we're very happy to have you here, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. As a journalist working in conflict zones for more than 25 years, I've been frightened. I feared for my life. I've had lots of guns pointed at me. I've been shot at. But I never really had the sensation that someone was hunting me down to kidnap me and, and, and incarcerate me and behead me, which is what would happen. So a lot of it um, 
was very, very hard for us to do. That was the first thing. The second thing, and you see a bit of it here, was that people were angry. Um, Syria, even before the war, was a complicated place to work. People living under dictatorships for that long, and they had been under the Assad dictatorship for more than 40 years, don't like to talk to you. Um, they, they're very suspicious. With, with, they should be. Uh, they're hauled off by the Mukabarat, the secret police, and they're tortured, and they're put in jail, and they never show up again. So that's what we were really up against. And making a film, which is not my genre, I'm, I'm a writer. Um, and being a writer, in conflict zones especially, means you can hide. If I wasn't with that film crew, <laughs> I would have just put a hijab on. I look Syrian. And I would have gone around by myself or with a, a Syrian guide. Um, but having a camera with you means that you're very um, susceptible and you're also very obvious. And people don't want to talk to you. They get frightened. They close up. And there's one scene later on where um, I'm chased out of a hospital. And I think that's actually the first time in my career that I went to talk to a doctor about how little he had, you know, no equipment, no, um, and because he said the UN had come to him, which I don't think is true because the UN has actually never been there, and promised him something and didn't deliver, they kind of associate everyone who's Western with the UN. And he literally chased me down the hallway and just said, you know, if you're not going to come help us, then get out. Um, so really, really difficult place to work. Which leads me to my main, the main reason, the main um, motive I have for doing this work, which started many years ago, is that I want to document uh, war crimes while they are happening so that I can preserve the evidence, so that people can say, this didn't happen. I'll have it in my hand. I'll have the notes, I'll have the documentation. If I'm with a photographer, we'll have photographs. And when I started many, many years ago, um, I learned that this was a tremendous power, that I wasn't a lawyer, I'm not a politician, I don't work for the UN. I, did, I do advise the UN on Syria, but I'm not, I don't work for the UN. But as a journalist, you can have a voice which is very resounding. And the other reason I do it is because once, shortly after Saddam fell in Baghdad in 2003, 2004, yeah. April 2004, April 9th, 2004, right? Three. 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 The statue came down in 2004. Yeah. So I was standing in the square when the statue came down, and I um, saw these American soldiers, young American soldiers, pulling it down with a rope. And, and then I went upstairs to my room to call my office, and I looked out the window, and I saw all these Iraqi people dragging the head of Saddam down the street on the rope like a dog. And I thought, oh no, it's all going to go horribly wrong. Um, shortly after that, that same day, I managed to get into a cell of a uh, Shia prison where Saddam had incarcerated thousands and thousands and thousands of Shias, Shias during his, his reign. And it was, a, it was a torture cell, and it was horrible. And in one of the little rooms I got into, someone had written in red pen or blood, I don't know, um, to my dear family, never forget that I was here. And at that moment, um, I realized the most important part of our job is to prove that these people are not alone. And I think that the four most beautiful words in the English language, and probably in German as well, is you are not alone. And I think the power of journalism, when it's, it's most noble, means that we can bring the stories of these people that don't have a voice. What, what I really try to do, and, and how I start it, and I'll tell you very briefly, and also I want to leave room for your questions, because I'm sure many of you have questions about Syria, and I'm very happy to, um, to answer it as much as you like. I started, um, I was a postgraduate student studying comparative literature, nothing further from being a journalist, never wanted to be a journalist. Um, somehow, I went to the Gaza Strip for the very first time, and it was though my world, the, 
the little academic world that I lived in, the bubble of it exploded. I, I couldn't believe that people lived with such injustice every day. And their stories were, were untold. And they had no one to go to. They had no justice, but they had no one to go to to say, this is what's happening to me. And basically, from that moment on, and I was mentored by an extraordinary German woman, a lawyer called Felicia Langer, who is uh, now in Heidelberg, I think. She's Israeli. Um, she had emigrated to Israel after the war. And she became a lawyer defending Palestinians in military court, even though she was an Israeli. Um, as you can imagine, she was not popular. Her life was made hellish. She was um, vilified. She was spat upon in the street. Her only child was bullied at school. Her office was bombed. She never won a case. And this was the reason I was so fascinated by her, is that she woke up every day. I think she had won actually one case since 1967, since the War of 67. But she still got up every single morning, and she went to her office, and she did this completely thankless work, because she felt that justice was important. So she said to me, if you have the ability to go to these places and write about these people, then you have the obligation. And I, I took that very seriously. Um, and I felt that the only way to document what happens during times of conflict is to be on the ground. It's not always easy, as you can see. In our industry, it's gotten harder and harder and harder with um, many reasons, the rise of more internet journalism, that print is not as uh, lucrative as it was before, that it's very, very, very expensive to do this kind of work, um, and that these days we need insurance, if you can believe it. We need war insurance to go there, because if we get injured, if we get kidnapped, we need to have some kind of umbrella protecting us. Um, from Gaza, I went immediately to Bosnia, to the war in Bosnia. Um, and I stayed in Sarajevo during the siege. Very formulative years for me and very powerful, um, emotionally, personally, and professionally, because it, it made me the person I am today. I mean, seeing this extraordinary resilience of people living under siege, medieval siege, people who didn't have water, electricity, who lived by candlelight, who made cheese out of rice on Christmas Eve to have something special to eat, who educated their children themselves, who lived with bombing, who fought insanity and tried to keep themselves sane by, by humor, by theater, by whatever they could, their imaginations, and they survived it. And the day the tram bell rang out at the end of the three and a half years of siege was the day it ended. And that war, Martha Gellhorn, who was one of Hemingway's many wives and uh, a war reporter, once said, you can only love one war. The rest is responsibility. That was my war. I mean, that sounds very pompous, but I, what I mean is that it formed me. It shaped me. Um, everything I know about compassion, about um, telling people's stories, about, um, about being there comes from the Bosnian War. After that, I went to Africa. Um, I, I went actually right from Sarajevo to the Rwandan genocide. And I think by that point, I had begun to see things that most normal people don't see in your, in your lifetime, and you shouldn't. Um, and that is the amount of dead and how cheap life became, in a sense. And the Rwandan genocide, a million people were killed in four months, um, which is extraordinary to think of, especially because they used, in many cases, machetes, which is labor-intensive killing. It's not like shooting someone. It takes a lot of energy to kill someone with a machete. I stayed in Africa for a long time because I felt that it was very underreported. And I felt, especially from the lens of a Western journalist, at the time I worked for the Times of London, we didn't talk about Africa much, black people. So I stayed, and I went from one horrific conflict to the next, um, to Liberia, where I saw child soldiers, seven, eight, nine years old, 
um, who were taught to kill at such an early age that it was almost as though their conscience wasn't yet formed. And one of the things that they had to do to prove themselves was they had to go back to their villages and kill a member of their family so that they could never go home again. And that would indoctrinate them, indoctrinate them into the way of killing. From there, I went to Sierra Leone, the Ivory Coast, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Burundi, Congo. Um, and then one day, I was walking down the street in Paris on a break, and uh, someone called me and said that the Twin Towers had just been, a plane had just flown into the Twin Towers. And they said, this is not George Orwell, this is real. And literally the next day, I found myself on a raft crossing from Tajikistan into Afghanistan over the river Oxus. And I followed the Northern Alliance, who were the, the American-backed Afghan fighters toppling the Taliban. And thus began a whole new set of wars, which were very different from the wars I had covered in the 90s in the Balkans and Africa. These were wars about terror. And from Afghanistan, there was Iraq. Sad, sad destruction of Iraq. Anyone working in Iraq, as I worked in Iraq for many years, in the Saddam time and in the aftermath of it, could see what would happen to Syria. Because the minute Saddam fell, all of the Ba'athists that I had been under, I, I had worked in the Saddam time, which meant that the Ba'athists controlled the Ministry of Inform Information where I worked, all got in their cars and took the road to Damascus, and they went straight to Damascus. It was pretty inevitable that they were going to eventually regroup and become ISIS. Um, that and that many of them who were sent to American prisons got their education in jihadism at the hands of being incarcerated by Americans. So there was, there was a history here. It didn't, Mosul didn't just fall on June 10th, 2014. It didn't just topple in a second. There was a, there was a history there to what happened. Um, the Arab Spring then came, and that was a moment of jubilation, actually. It was really incredible to be in Tunisia and Libya and, and Tahir Square and to see people rising up, kids mainly. And I had seen this happen in Serbia in 2000 when a group of, a friend, a group of friends of mine who were students, engineering students, basically overthrew Milosevic, dictator Milosevic, in 10 days. Um, it, this was before cell, well, cell phones, but not internet. And they used um, the early, the very early social media to gather people and to use people power. And only one person died in that um, change of government. And that was someone who had a heart attack in the crowd. But the Arab Spring was different. Um, though they yearned for democracy, in many ways, some of these countries which had lived under dictatorships for so long didn't have the institutions to back them up. So there was not rule of law or human rights or freedom of expression or freedom of press in Libya, in, in certainly in Syria. Uh, Egypt more so, there were more civil, civil society there than other places, but they still were not ready. So to expect them to go from dictatorships to immediate Jeffersonian democracy wasn't going to happen. Um, in a way, it was inevitable that much of it would fail, and I still don't believe the Arab Spring is the Arab winter. I think that democracy takes a long time to come to fruition. And I think the American Revolution happened in 1776, and it was nearly 20 years later that the Constitution was written. So these things take time, and also we can't put our lens, our German lens, our British lens, our French lens, of what democracy is onto countries that have never experienced it before and lived under dictatorships. So now I come to Syria. And I think Pope Francis said it the most beautifully, the beloved abandoned country. And Syria, almost six years on, six years of war, I can't tell you what this means to the fabric of the society how it's completely broken it down. Aleppo, if any of you are following it, 
is in the process of being obliterated off the face of the earth. Um, now, the government, the Syrian government and the Russians will say we're trying to kill terrorists, but their targets are largely civilians. Hospitals, schools, um, bakeries, any, any form of life to just wipe it off the face of the earth as a, as a tactic to say, you want freedom? You want to rise up against me? This is what you will get. So I think when I made this film and wrote my book, which I'm happy to sign for any of you that want it, I think we have it in German and English, right? Um, what I want it to do, while, I mean, I am, I was a student of politics and international affairs, what I really wanted to do was to capture the lives. And earlier I spoke to Alex, who's a historian here, a fellow at the American Academy, and I wanted to know, you know, what, what's daily life like during the medieval times? What did people eat? What did they wear? What kind of shoes did they wear? How did they stay warm in the winter? How did they perform surgery? And in a way, when I go into war zones, this is what fascinates me and what I want to know about much more than what the soldiers' tactics are, because to me, they're, that's not nearly as interesting as how communities get together to save themselves. There are these very heroic people called the White Helmets, and you might have heard of them. They were nominated for a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, they lost it to Bob Dylan and <laughs> several other people. Um, but they, they're they a really good example of how communities can pull together to um, save themselves. They were ordinary guys, like literally auto mechanics. Um, no one, I think, that I met had been trained past high school. Uh, there was one fireman, but most of them were vegetable sellers, students. And when they realized that there was no UN coming to save them, no international community, they were going to learn how to pull people out of the bombing. Now, I don't know if any of you have had the horror of being in a bombing, and I hope you haven't. But what happens, of course, is that the ceilings fall through and you get buried. Um, but you don't die a lot of times. You stay alive for quite a while. What these guys do is they go and they find the people who are living and they spend hours at great risk to themselves to pull people out and to shovel them out and to get them. And I say great risk to themselves because they have a 70% fatality because the Russians and the government bomb them as they are pulling people out. They call it the second tap. They, a bomb goes in, they rush in to save people, they bomb them again. But what one of them told me, which I found so moving, was that they're all from the local community. So each neighborhood has their own civil defense. And one guy said to me, you know, if you, if you were from here, this neighborhood, and you got bombed and you were lying under cinder blocks and you couldn't move and you were pinned down and your legs were broken and your back was broken and you wanted to have hope, you would think that, oh, but I know Ahmed, you know, he's one of the white helmets. He's going to come get me because he knows I'm here. And I thought that was one of the most extraordinary things I had ever heard of people helping people. So I'm going to end my talk and then open up to you with just one thought. Um, and that is that, you know, people often say to me, but this is such gruesome stuff you do. Um, and I don't see it like that, actually. I feel incredibly privileged. I feel that um, not only for small things, like I once said to someone, you know, you, you don't know what it's like to enjoy a shower unless you yourself have not had running water for some time. And if you, if you take for granted water or a shower or electricity, if you've ever had to work with candlelight or if you've ever had to not have medication when you need it, or not, you know, not ate rice for six weeks, then you appreciate life in a way that, you know, all of us probably don't. And I'm so grateful that very early in my life, in my early 20s, I lived like this. And so I know I never take a shower without thinking, wow, this is amazing. Um, that, and that I feel so honored that people share their stories with me, that they trust me with them, and that they give them to me in a sense. And I never want to be, I never wanted to be a vulture because that is what one of the dangers of being a reporter in these conflicts is. And I've seen plenty of my colleagues thrust microphones into the faces of kids who've been bombed and burnt and say, you know, how do you feel? And it's horrible to see. 
I never wanted to do that, and not that I'm perfect, and not that I'm any better than they are, but I just, what I wanted to do was to show how they lived so that they will not be forgotten. And especially not just the living, but the dead. And one of my favorite stories I've ever done, which was one of the most moving things, and it gets me very emotional thinking about it. During the war in Sarajevo, I used to go every day to the morgue. And the reason I did that was the morgue is the place where you get the most information. You know, what happened overnight, where the fighting was, um, is there a typhoid epidemic? You, you, you find out everything. And the guy who ran the morgue was an extraordinary man. And I would sit and have tea with him, and I would go with Kurt, another colleague of ours, and we would sit every morning and we'd talk to him, how many people died overnight, where's the front line moving to? And there was another guy there too, who was always drunk. Because, you know, quite rightly, how could you stand to see so many people killed? And, you know, these were children that were being brought in, young people every day um, by the shelling, by the sniping. One day, the, the second guy, his, uh, his helper, killed himself. He couldn't stand to see it anymore. But Mirza, the guy who ran it, kept going. Until one day, he came in during a very fierce attack on, on the city of Sarajevo. And he was walking to work. And he remembers it was kind of a nice day. The weather was good. And he gets into the morgue and sees a body on the slab. And he pulls back the sheet. And it's his son, who was a, a fighter um, in the Bosnian army. And he was never the same after that, quite rightly. But what he did was he kept books <clears throat> called the books of the Book of the Dead of every single person that passed through that morgue and who they were and how they died and what they had been and anything he could gather about them, any documentation about their life. So many, many, many years later, 20 years later, I went to find him. And it took a while, and I finally found him. He was living in a farm outside of Sarajevo in the hills. And together, we went to find the books of the dead. And it turned out the Bosnian government had kept them as in an archive. And we went together, and we went through each one. And he would say, ah, that was a little girl that they brought in, and she was so pretty. And, and that was the brightest math student in all of the high schools of Sarajevo. And he was only 12. And, he went through all of them. And then we went back to his house to have tea. And this guy walked in who looked exactly like his son. And I kind of, you know, he was about 19 or 20 and I went like that. And he said, oh, I didn't tell you. When my son was killed, his wife was pregnant. And this is the boy. And I love that story because it's so sad and it's so poignant, but it's, it's life. You know, the living, the dead, the circle of life. Um, so that's really what I do. Um, and now, I mean, any questions you have about Syria, I'll answer the best I can, or anything, really. Very happy to open the floor to you. <laughs> I know the journalists always go first. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Alison Smale. I work for the New York Times and I also worked in Bosnia at one time. Um, the film that you showed, do you know anything about the people who you showed there, like the guy who was so angry, this is what freedom looks like? Um, do you know if they're still alive? And exactly when did you go in and do that? Because I think it wasn't quite clear. So we started that in December 2012. And that was the very beginning of the rise of ISIS. So later in the film, you'll see, it was we, we knew that Al-Qaeda was there, Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda franchise. But we didn't yet realize what ISIS was. It was just starting. But the city was becoming very par paranoid. That guy was, you know, you could see, very paranoid, very um, changing rapidly and becoming more jihadist, more radical in a, in, in a city that hadn't been like that before. So one of the best stories that's come out of it, and I shouldn't tell you in case you watch it, but there's a doctor in the film, and there's also a Syrian woman who's a photographer, and she's great. And they ended up falling in love, 
and um, getting married and having a baby. They were each with other people. And during the course of it, they, they fell in love and they had a baby and they go back and forth between Turkey and Aleppo. But his hospital was the one that was bombed in May, um, last May, 2016. And uh, you might have read about it, where the last pediatrician in Aleppo was, um, was killed. So I tried to keep in touch with most of them, but unlike Bosnia, Syria is so difficult because there's no Western journalists there. We were basically pushed out in, I think I last went back in the end of 2014, 2015 maybe, and, and even that, it just was too much for me because the kidnapping and the beheading is not, not a risk you want to take. Um, and to go the other side, to go to Damascus, you need a visa and they usually don't give them to people like us. Um, so it's very hard. There's, there's really no eyes and ears on the ground, independent. Unlike Bosnia, there's no UN there. There's no foreign NGOs. Um, there's very few, I mean, there are a few brave souls that go by themselves at great, great risk, but they're not even getting aid convoys into Aleppo, so let alone journalists. So um, very, very hard to keep in touch with people. And as much as I you know, rail against social media, the one thing I did, which was, I thought, pretty amazing, um, I started something on WhatsApp between my friends who had survived the siege of Sarajevo and people in Darea, which was a city that was brutally besieged. It was one of the Assad starve or surrender cities. There were cities that he picked out and basically said, we are going to starve you. And they did. Or you surrender. And after three and a half years of living on grass and roots and a bit of salt, they, they surrendered a couple last month. Um, but I started this channel between my friends from Sarajevo to give these guys in Darea advice, you know, like how to stay alive and how to stay sane and how, you know, how to organize yourself and how to make oil lamps. And, and, it, and it was very, um, I was really proud of myself because I'm a real social, I'm a real dinosaur with social media. And it was the one time I really felt like what's up really does, you know, there could be something to this, but very hard to communicate with people inside. Rick Inker, a lawyer. Um, pardon me, I adore very much your presentation today. Um, the question I would like to focus on is uh, whether, because you mentioned that the community still somehow manages to, to, to help each other, to organize whatever daily needs require, um, could you, from this perspective, imagine yourself some, 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 some sort from, of living together again? I mean, over the boundaries, cross-border the boundaries of ethnicity, of religion, is this still thinkable in theory? I, I mean, there's what I would like to see happen, and then there's the reality of what probably will happen. I mean, I imagine that Syria will be factioned in the way that Bosnia was. Um, which has been disastrous. I mean, it has ended the war. And, you know, I'm here as the Hol Richard Holbrook lecturer, and Richard Holbrook did end the war in Bosnia. He was um, a difficult man and, and a stubborn one, but he wanted the killing to end at, at any cost, in a sense. And I feel that, I often wonder that if Richard Holbrook was around today, if the war would have gone on as long. Because I feel that he could have corralled people into a room and said, shut up. This war is good, the killing is going to stop. But on the other hand, what Dayton did bring, the Dayton peace accords that ended the war in Bosnia, is that it froze front lines and it rewarded the perpetrators of violence. And I don't like to say this, but I think that Assad has won the war, basically. Um, and what will happen next is that they'll have to carve up the country in a way that people can live together. Um, but it's been horribly damaged. It's been, it's been infused with hate. It's been burnt alive. There are nine million people displaced just within the country. Um, there are four million people outside. How do you ever go home again? And I think that takes Generations and generations. But having said that, there is some hope. Look at Rwanda. 
Rwanda is a real success story, and, and I hate this term that the UN uses, lessons learned. But Rwanda actually did pull out of one of the most horrific, horrific uh, epics, dark periods of humanity, and functions a lot better than Bosnia does now. So, I, I mean, I would imagine that what will have to happen is there'll be UN peacekeeping forces employed to protect the Alawites because they'll be slaughtered. There'll be a partition for the Kurds um, who have fought very, you know, strongly and bravely against ISIS. And we're going to see in the next few days and weeks what's going to happen with Mosul. The battle for Mosul launched this morning at 4 a.m. So I think the next days and weeks are going to see where ISIS is going. Um, but your question, can they live together again? Well, they have to. <laughs> They're going to have to, but it takes a long time to eradicate that kind of hatred after the terrible, terrible things that have happened. The human rights abuse, the torture, the incarceration, the, the destruction of Aleppo. Like Schmidt's uh, film, uh, filmmaker too. Uh, I wanted, were you ever tempted to, to take sides? To say, I can't take this anymore, this, this injustice. I will have to agitate um, my country or, you know, take sides, and organize people in a particular direction. Do you mean me as a journalist or if, if I was a Syrian? You as a journalist. Well, I, I find it impossible not to take sides. I mean, I know that as journalists, we're meant to be completely objective, but it's very hard. I mean, I'm a human rights reporter, so basically my dossier is to document war crimes. Um, I, I mean, I cannot not be on the side of victims of state terror. Um, and I, I find that, you know, I try, I've worked on the other sides, I've, I try to go there and I, I try to listen to people and I do, and I try to tell their story because there always is another side to the story, there always is. Um, but I'm not an activist and I'm, I don't run an advocacy program and I'm not an NGO and I'm not a social worker even though I often feel like I am. Um, I'm, I'm meant to just be in, impassioned and tell the story. Um, which is, I, I think that basically, I mean, if, if you read my book, I say in it, I don't have to exaggerate any of this because it's horrible enough. And having said that, you know, the opposition were not angels and they are guilty of their own crimes. And I spent a lot of time in hospitals on the government side, on the Assad side with young soldiers, um, young men, 17, 18, 19 years old, who had fought in Homs and other places and had been you know, terribly wounded and heard their stories. And I spent a lot of time with Christians and other minorities who were terrified that if the opposition wins, the Sunni opposition, then they'll be completely pushed out of a country that was once multi-ethnic and, and had a great tradition of tolerance. So I think it's really important not to get um, completely inflamed by it. And I think when I was younger, it was easier for me to be, I mean, for instance, covering Israel and Palestine. Um, at 22, 23, to go and see the refugee camps in Gaza and the West Bank, I was so angry. You know, it was an anger that kind of fueled me for the longest time. And then I, I had to, because I worked for Rupert Murdoch, to cover the Israeli side. And you begin to open up and you begin to see, well, this, 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 there's still, two wrongs don't make a right, but um, you have to be able to see it from both sides. And then I think what you write, if you write the truth and you write it plainly and you write it clearly or you film it plainly, it tells its own story. You don't need to make a point. Have you ever been uh, embedded journalist? No, I've only done it once. I hate that. It's not my thing. I, I know that a lot of journalists do it and they have to do it. And it's funny, it's usually a lot of my American male colleagues love it because they get to hang out with soldiers and they get to be with guns and I hate it. I mean, I really don't like, I don't like anyone telling me what to do, first of all. 
I don't like being, you know, I like to do my own thing. I like to be by myself. I like to work independently. So to have like a bunch of soldiers yelling at me, you know, when to get up and when to, who to talk to. And also, it's not what I do. I mean, I like talking to people, communities and um, the people in the village and the, the sheikh and the village elder and the, the nuns and the priests and the, and I don't want to talk to soldiers all the time because they always say the same thing, <laughs> you know, and I'm not interested in guns. So embed it, it's not for me. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. Um, when you get back from uh, Syria and you're sitting down to write, how do you decide what detail makes it in and what detail doesn't? Gets harder and harder. Um, usually, I mean, like a lot of writers, I think, I often, when I'm working on, I'm in the field, I'll see something or I'll get, and I'll be like, ah, that's my opening line. And, you know, I usually have the opening line and the ending, but it's the middle that's hard to get. And sometimes, you know, we all know writing is not just inspiration. It's that hard work that you sit down and putting pieces together like a puzzle. And very complicated with a war is complicated is Syria where, you know, even I have to put post-its on my wall about what factions are fighting with what side now, today, and what, which front line has shifted. Um, to get information in to people that they're going to want to read, because when you get involved in the minutia of it, you start, if I talk to Syria heads or Syria, you know, analysts, I mean, we're such bores. I mean, we get down to, you know, really nitty gritty. And that's not what most people want to hear. So you really have to work out what, what message you want to project, and not sounding like a propagandist, but you know what you want to say, and then trying to be as clear as possible, especially with a very complicated quagmire story like that. I usually try to get all the details in, though. <laughs> uh, someone else? Yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much for your <coughs> talk and uh, bringing this story very close. Aleppo, you showed Aleppo 2013, 2014, I guess, or 2012. Today it's much more leveled. Yeah. But it's also a divided city. Yeah. Because part of it is still with the government. Can you say, can you follow with your friends what is happening inside the city with, among people? Is it, are they completely cordoned off? Are they destroying the western part as much as they're destroying the eastern part? Is life continuing on a personal basis? This well, people, you know, it's interesting because, city, interesting. yeah, it, it's divided. And there's 250,000 people in the east. Um, the west side, which is controlled by the government, have, uh, you know, naturally are, have more access to things. But their, their life is also frozen. Even though they are on the, the winning side, um, it's like the Serbs during the war um, in Bosnia. They weren't the ones being attacked, but at the same time, their lives froze. People who were getting university degrees suddenly couldn't continue it. Um, there were sanctions. Your, per, your, your, your nationality has become a pariah. Um, I do talk to people inside, again, like the wonder of Facebook and things like that, where you could do messaging. And, I always ask them um, what they miss. Like, what, I always ask what they're eating on a daily basis and what they miss. And one of my friends said to me something which I thought was so tragic. He said, you know what I miss the most? It's not anything big. It's I miss watching football with my family, just sitting around watching football at night with my family because my family are gone. Some of them are dead. Some of them have left. And we don't, obviously, there's no electricity, so there's no TV. Um, so I think people, what someone asked earlier about communities organizing themselves, I think the communities actually manage to get food and, you know, they get water in and they'll, they'll get, they'll manage to use generators or to get electricity. But what they, what they can't manage is the day-to-day um, the -day erosion of their culture and their lives. You know, so it's almost as though, who are you now? Where's your identity? Where's your future? Um, the way we plan in our diaries what you're doing next week or next month, I mean, they just can't. And 
I think that six years, I have to stress this again, is, I mean, Alison, the war in Bosnia was, you know, three and a half, nearly four, and that was just the forever war. This is double that. Um, so it's an entire childhood, uh, I think of it as an entire grammar school education. So children that were born, and some of the kids, parents that I spoke to in Dorea, their children hadn't seen a piece of fresh fruit. They didn't know what it was because they, you know, five years had gone by. Um, so it's basically first grade to fifth grade, gone. And all of your memories gone. And if you're forced to leave and become a refugee, what you leave behind, it, it's not even as much as your, you know, what you're taking with you, but what you're leaving behind is everything. Um, so I can't stress enough that the need for us to be compassionate to, to people that come to our, our countries um, and, and what, they're, what they're going through. Um, I'm curious, you were in, in Iraq when the Americans came in. Mm. We haven't gone into Syria and other Western countries haven't gone in to help. Do you think it would have made a difference if we were, had been, I mean, Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I really strongly believe, um, and funny enough, I'm the world's biggest liberal, and I've noticed people on Twitter call me a neocon, which is so funny because I so, couldn't be further from that. In 2013, after the chemical attack in Ghouta, I, I truly believe, had President Obama not adopted this policy of nonchalance and non-commitment and had very clear... Um, strategic strikes against certain points that sent President Assad a message, you're not going to get away with this. You cannot gash your own people. We would have a different scenario today. Um, having said that, that's hindsight. It didn't happen. It was very close. The jets were on the French runways. The Brits, the, the French were going along with it. David Cameron was humiliated. And that was Obama's excuse to hide behind. Well, if the Brits aren't going to go with us, we can't do it. Um, what can be done today, I mean, Hillary Clinton's package of no-fly zone, I mean, it's easier said than done I mean, because you've got the Russians involved now. Um, so how can you actually, how can you shoot down aircraft that's in airspace if it's a, a Russian plane? Then you're talking about World War III. Um, it's almost... I think there has to be a negotiated agreement at this point um, b because the, the amount of killing, I mean, two days ago there were 41 kids killed in one day in Aleppo. I mean, every single one of those kids has a life and a story and a history and, a, and a parents and grandparents and cousins. And, you know, it's the longer we go on with this kind of carnage and this kind of bloodshed, the more immune we become to the horror of it. And we think oh yeah, another day in Aleppo. Well, we shouldn't be thinking like that. We should be thinking, this is horrific and we've abandoned it. Even Bosnia, even Bosnia in the end, we went to the aid of. And, and Syria truly has been abandoned. Yes. Yeah. Pardon me for asking second time, but uh, simply because you put it now into a more strategic and tactical um, uh, level of discussion, um, is this perhaps what you are, uh, with, what you have witnessed that you have presented today, is simply the tip of the iceberg, and perhaps even, especially when mentioning Mosul, uh, right at our doorsteps, uh, and the carnage that is probably going to take place over there if there isn't a negotiated solution. I mean, what's worth it? I mean, deploring uh, hundreds and thousands of casualties if there's perhaps millions to come? Well, do you mean that if we sent in American troops and, and, and multinational, or do you just mean, you know, whenever they say we need boots on the ground, I always say there are boots on the ground. There's Syrian boots on the ground. There's plenty of people to fight. It's just that we, up until now, haven't trained or or vet it the right people, and we haven't focused on it. I mean, and, and, you know, I'm a fan of President Obama's, but on this one, he really messed up. Because he very, he very pointedly wanted to be a president who left his legacy as someone that pulled America out of wars and not got us into it. But the fact is that this has been a genocide. It started out as a slow genocide, and now it's a, it's a 
it is a genocide. And I think as part of the international community who witnessed Bosnia, who witnessed Rwanda, who witnessed the Holocaust, we cannot allow this to happen, um, not on our watch. So I think that um, the tip of the iceberg with Mosul, I, I think that until, you know, in, in the Middle East, they always go back to the Palestinian question and say that until that is sorted out, um, because a lot of anger and a lot of resentment still comes from the occupation and the treatment of Palestinians. So I think that, you know, the Middle East, people look at it and they think, oh, it's such a mess. How, do, how will we ever sort this out? But I think we could start by, by trying to send, you know, trying to be more actively involved in what's happening in Syria now. Um, I think it's past the point of diplomatic negotiations. It's broken down on every level. Um, poor, poor Stefan Di Mistura, who is the UN Special Envoy, is a, a good man and genuinely wants to try to end the war, but it's gone beyond that. Um, I think it needs really strong leadership now to come in and say, okay, enough is enough. One, then two, then three. <laughs> the Korean government think that the Syrians will go back after the war. You are saying there will be an end of the war and they will be needed there. So will they go? Well, I, I work with refugees a lot. I worked for UNHCR on the Syrian refugee crisis um, in 2013 and 14. I've never met a refugee in, in 25 years of working with them who ever said, you know, I, I really want to leave my country and go to Sweden or Germany because I can get a job there. They don't want to go. They want to go home. But what happens is that what have they got to go home to? It will take years to rebuild Aleppo, um, Homs, Hama, Idlib, these places that have been completely bombed and destroyed. So there won't be work. And I think the more people go, I mean, they want to go home. And I think most of them will try to. But for instance, the Lebanese government um, never accepted Palestinians who went there as uh, Lebanese citizens, because they said, we don't want them to become Lebanese. We want them to go home. But how does that actually happen? I mean, they're doing the same thing for Syrians right now. They're not making them Lebanese citizens because they want them to go home. But pragmatically and practically, I don't understand how that can happen, at least immediately when that, that country is ripped apart. Um, there'll be a period of transition, obviously. And I think in Bosnia, it took a while for people to go home, didn't it? I mean, there are still... Yeah, yeah it take, I think it takes time. We have a few other questions here and then there, yeah. Sorry for my confusion, but um, you had talked about taking sides before and then you were saying that the, we shouldn't have boots on the ground or we should at least intervene. Um, I have a hard time understanding who are the good guys in Syria? <laughs> there are none. Uh -huh. But if we were to intervene, who would we be helping? Are you talking about the FSA or you know? I, I think a humanitarian intervention. I mean, that's really what how I put it in that kind of amorphous term, humanitarian intervention, but one that would allow access to um, aid getting into places like Aleppo and Idlib and and Mosul. I mean, it, it's not it's not Syria, but you know there are I think. 200,000 people are going to flee the fighting in Mosul in the next few weeks, 200,000. The IRC, the International Red Cross, only has tents for 60,000. So it's so hard with good guys and bad guys, you know? I mean, it's, it's what we always want to do, and I understand that. And even as journalists, we always try to find the good guys and the bad guys. In this war, I mean, the, the, I think it's the civilians that we have to really consider, like people that... Actually, I mean, I have friends in Damascus living under the regime who started the war not having any feelings about anything. I mean, they, they lived under Assad for so long that they were used to living under a dictatorship. Of course they wanted freedom and a, a democracy. But when the war came, they didn't know who to support. So they started supporting the opposition, and then ISIS rose, and, and uh, Nusra. So they didn't want to support jihadists, so they went back to not supporting Assad, but thinking it's a bit safer to have him leading the country than it is to have some crazy guy from Saudi Arabia. Um, 
So there's all kinds of, then there's the Christians who, because they're terrified, supported Assad because he felt that they felt that they would protect him. But then you'll have Shia fighters fighting in the opposition, and you'll have Sunni fighters fighting for Assad. So I mean, it's, it's a bit like Yugoslavia again in that way, that you can't really break it down to Sunni Shia, a Sunni Shia war. For me, it's humanitarian. It's all down to protecting civilians. You know, the UN mandate of right to protect, which I think, I can't remember how many member countries voted on in 2005, that, you know, again, under our watch, we have, to, we have the right to protect people. It's just, we're not protecting them. Responsibility to protect, sorry. Because it's a civil, because it's a civil war. It is genocide by another state. May I suggest at this point? I see you have more questions. This is not the only one. We've been one. waiting one more question for him, and then we can go. Okay, I was just going to say, why don't we have one more question, <laughs> and then we conclude today's session? So please go ahead. If you be so kind of wait for the microphone, because otherwise people in the other room cannot hear you. Okay, my name is Franz Josef Prepper. I have been working in Syria from 2005 up to nine. And I was working with Dr. Dadari, who was at that time a, an important figure in reforms, economic reforms. And I was deeply impressed at that time from the uh, tolerant, on my impression at that time, tolerant system. I mean, especially with religious tolerance. And the question is for me, I just, uh, I'm a bit speechless today because I, I have not the right idea how this conflict started, increased, and what, on your point of view, are the main reasons for this development. Because we have to discuss or think about the reasons of a conflict. Because this country has been, at my time I saw it, and I had a lot of contacts within the country and different groups, and I was compared with other Muslim countries, Islamic countries. I've been now working for four years in Kabul. And if you see the situation over there, compared with the situation I saw in, in Syria. Syria was, for me, a very tolerant, is in general, tolerant country. So I'm deeply astonished and speechless about the reasons for this development of the conflict. Do you think that partially it was the economic, the country, the rural versus the city mentality and the Alawite versus the, the Alawites being in a position of power, but yet they were a minority? Do you think it has something to do with that? Especially if you were there during the time of the 2005 to 2009, wasn't that the time of the drought? I think so, because the country was in the good road. I mean, they were, yeah. if you imagine at that time, down with a, with a group of 300 businessman was invited here in Germany with a big conference. Yeah. And I have uh, articles on that. It's just only six years ago. And Aleppo was becoming a tourist destination. Yeah. So uh, I'm really speechless about this development and I have no uh, kind of answer. At what point uh, the, the conflict increases and what are the reasons for that and what is your impression of I mean, I think if you go back to the 80s when, when um, Assad Per um, repressed the, the Sunnis in Hama and the, the roots of that and the kind of feeling that many people had that, of living under a dictatorship. I mean, I think it came down to that. And then it was triggered by the Jasmine Revolution. I think, that, I think the Tunisian Revolution had a huge effect on the entire region of people seeing, wow, well, we can vote and it actually means something. Or, you know, we can get positions in the army or in the police and, and not be Alawites or not be a certain social um, caste. 
And I think that that just triggered. And I think the moment he then started firing upon his own people, which was, again, you know, without hindsight, that was a moment when diplomacy might have worked if, say, the Germans and the French and the Brits and the Americans got together and sent a delegation and said, no, you are not going to get away with killing your own people. This is not going to happen. You need to stay in line. Maybe it could have all ended differently, but it didn't. He fired on his own people in Dara. He killed children, and then it grew. So every Friday became a demonstration all over Syria, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was youth-led, and it was the uh, social media, which also played a huge role in all of these revolutions. I mean, the Egyptian revolution was basically launched by, by Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I think it just grew and grew and grew, and then it got hijacked by the Islamists. It didn't, that, I mean, that to me was the crucial moment in 2012 when the Islamists hijacked it, when Qatar, Saudi, Turkey began to get completely, uh, to pull it to pieces, Iran, Russia. Then we had a war that was out of control that couldn't be, could not be put, put out. So I, think, I actually think you're right. I mean, I think it started small and it, there were moments when it could have been Control, but it wasn't. Janine Di Giovanni, let me thank you at this point for your not only insightful, but very engaged and um, compassionate uh, report on the war, not only in Serbia, but your wide ranging, if you like, discourse on war and what it means to be in a war zone and what it means to those people who are affected by this, who are the victims, quite literally the victims, and even those who on different sides fight for if you like, different ideals and don't seem to meet at one point. And the difficulties uh, that you as a journalist are faced with um, in such a situation. It takes a very courageous woman to do what you're doing. And um, I think we all admire you for the work you do. And we are very grateful to you for sharing your impressions and your work and the, the way you deal with these difficult topics tonight with us here. Let me thank you for asking intelligent, short, precise, Questions? No, seriously, because that makes a discussion very lively. And now I invite you all into the next room to drinks and nibblies to continue that debate and discussion. Ask her for a signature in the book that you'll be buying outside. And then maybe continue on your way back home to try to solve that conflict. I'm not joking. I'm only half joking. Because we talked about this very early on. There are different ways of making people see reason and discussion is what we do here, and this is part of that process. Thank you very much for being here tonight at the American Academy. We'll see you outside. <laughs>